It's FAQ NYC Offsite, where the New Yorkers podcast from the newsroom by and for New Yorkers, the city, steps back to take different and deeper dives into some of the things that are always happening here in the only place in the world. I'm Harry Siegel, here with Sean Howe, the author of Agents of Chaos, Thomas King Forsyth, High Times, and the Paranoid End of the 1970s, a book about plants, in several senses of the word, paranoia, the press, and pot, among other things, the dizzyingly cinematic, and has a ton of New York history threaded through it, along with jaw-dropping stories involving everyone from, like, Abby Hoffman to Jane Hoffa, Jimmy Buffett to Johnny Rodden, and everything from Andy Warhol getting pied to Catherine Ann Porter hiding her hero from the authorities in her cabin on the boat in the luxury ship he'd snuck off in. Uh, Sean, thank you for joining us and for writing this unbelievably rich, dank history, just like a Russian doll of cautionary tales. And let's jump right in. High Times is the subtitle of the book, but the bulk of it is centered around UPS, the Underground Press Syndicate, which later became the Alternative Press Syndicate, the Forsad, as he named himself, ran before starting the Pot Magazine, which he funded from his own pot smuggling, and the quickly became one of the biggest circ magazines in the country at a time when many states were first legalizing the stuff. So can you talk a little about all that, how it ties in <laughs> with Watergate, and about this character Forsad, how he's perceived by the Yippies, White Panthers, and others at a time when it seemed like everybody suspected and or accused everybody else, sometimes with reason of being a cop or a provocateur, or a snitch. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for the introduction, and it's good to be here. Um, uh, if anybody knows the name Tom Fursad, and a lot of people don't, um, it's because he was the founder of High Times Magazine. Um, but before that, uh, he was this kind of shadowy figure who just appeared on the countercultural radical scene uh, at the very end of the 60s when everything was... Um, kind of splitting up into factions and everybody was on edge. And he came from Arizona and took over something called the Underground Press Syndicate. And that was a consortium of all the underground newspapers around the world, um, uh, around the country. Uh, not not the world at that point yet. Um, but he he sort of just jumped into big conferences uh, of radicals and took over a little bit. He he kind of insinuated himself and drew attention to himself and made plays for power and uh, aroused everyone's suspicions immediately. So, you know, the Abby Hoffmans and the Jerry Rubins and the John Sinclairs of the world kind of wondered where this guy came from. Um, you know, it won... I opened the book with a, a scene at a drug symposium in Buffalo and everyone, you know, the guys that I just mentioned, they're all kind of housed in a, uh, uh, a dorm room waiting to, to do their panels. And Forsad comes in, throws a gun on the bed and says, Hey, I'm the head of the underground press syndicate. And people start just saying, this guy's a cop. And that was something that would, kind of dog him for the rest of his life. The idea that, you know, maybe this guy works for the government. Um, so he moves to New York in 1970. Um, and the underground press syndicate was housed in a loft, uh, on East 17th street, uh, near union square. And he continued, you know, for, for sod basically, uh, tried to get as much media attention as he could. And uh, he did this through a lot of stunts, through, um, you know, asking, you know, people at newspapers for favors and planting items. Um, he really wanted to make the underground press a uh, important, you know, part of the media landscape. And, uh, uh, you know, there were a few stunts that maybe went too far, like, you know, pieing a, a witness at a congressional hearing uh that landed him on the front page of the daily news um and also ensured that he would not get uh press credentials for the white house and so you know this this was the kind of thing that he was uh working for and up against uh in the early 70s but at the same time he's doing 
pies and pulling guns. People like Abby Hoffman, who he later turns against in a more substantial ways. He's also making, I think, a some ways real serious and prescient case for the underground press, for some of the stories it's able to get to, for for why it needs recognition. And you know, as the book goes through all the ways in which it seemed to be ahead of revelations that were coming in terms of Watergate, in terms of uh, the government spying on people and all these other parts. So, you know, he seems like maybe he's a cop. I'd love to know about your research. You spent years on this book. What you were hoping to find and, and where all that ended up. Um, but he's, you know, he's a young guy. He's younger than he's in his 30s when he dies, um, mm -hmm. commits suicide. Uh, but but he seemed like someone who was both very aggressively an asshole and a shakedown artist mm -hmm. um, a lot of the time, but also like somebody who has the, these sort of serious and interesting principles, some of which still still resonate, like very hard to separate. Yeah, a um, a very fascinating figure, which I guess is what, you know, pulled me in. I I first just came across his name and I thought, how is it somebody who you know, kind of played a part behind the scenes in, um, you know, like an important First Amendment case and um, drug smuggling. And uh, he was very involved in the punk rock movement uh, right at the start. He funded Punk Magazine. Um, I thought, how how can this all be one guy? And yet I've never heard of him. Um, you know, he's like, a Zelig or a Forrest Gump who just keeps popping up at these different moments of history. And so uh, eventually, I I guess I sort of saw him as um, a vehicle to sort of tell the story that, you know, connects. We have a we have a very, um, I guess, stereotypical idea of what the 60s were, you know, you see any documentary or movie about the 60s and they you you know get together by the young bloods and uh you know it's it's woodstock it's altamont and then it kind of cuts you, you might have watergate in the middle there but then it's pretty much the end of the 70s and it's um gas lines and it's jimmy carter and then it's reagan and i kind of wanted to be able to tell another story of the 1970s um and to you know uh to say like this is this is what happened it didn't go exactly from like yippies to yuppies that's the you know the very pat way of of saying you know everybody sold out um but forsad was was in a way he was like the last radical standing so and, yeah and talk a little about the uh the zippies and sure. then the rippies and and how they relate <laughs> to, to to the yippies because you can sort of feel the thing eating itself just as, as you're reading this yeah, so, you know, if anyone's not familiar with the Yippies, um, you know, they were these leftist uh, pranksters. Jerry Rubin and Abby Hoffman would certainly be the um, most famous among them. You know, they they did stunts, you know, like like throwing out cash on the stock market floor. Um, they, you know, were involved in like a, a, a raising of the Pentagon at the at the big march in 1967 where they tried to uh you know exercise the evil spirits from the pentagon um and they were they were like countercultural heroes they were celebrities and forsad was very drawn to them um but also very quickly uh became uh, attached to the idea that they were selling out and that they were not pure enough um Part of that happened because Forsad was involved in the production of Abby Hoffman's Steal This Book, and there was a dispute over credit and money for that. Um, so, you know, they they held like a uh, they they worked outside of this the system, the the legal system. They had a kind of like hippie tribunal at uh, you know at Washington Square Methodist Church basement, and uh, they they worked that out on their own. But after that, Forsad was always um, kind of aiming for Abby Hoffman and Jerry Rubin. So the Zippies were 
his way of getting back at them and a a, a more radical force uh, to to fight back. This is the sort of book where you end up with like maybe eight pages about this trial, and it really is meant <laughs> to be a trial, a Judson Memorial to decide who's fucked who, so to speak, uh, between between Abby Hoffman and 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 for Assad. And it, it's meant to be a, almost a restorative justice type thing. Uh, okay. Hoffman ends up paying out a little at the end in what seems like a fair conclusion, but then is treated, the book says, as as basically a loss and embarrassment to him. Uh, and, and in some ways, you know, Forsyth is like, throw all these over 30s out. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, these old people don't represent us anymore. You know, he, he is shaking down at different points. I would use the term like um, big musicians and like sort of music festivals, like either you're going to cut me in or, you know, uh, right. or, or you're going to get hurt. Right, right. He he teamed uh, with the Young Lords. Uh, there was a, a festival up in Randall's Island and uh, the New York Pop Festival. And that was like a um, a shakedown that almost went too too well. Because mm-hmm. the the acts pretty much all all canceled and everybody tore down the fences and you know uh, sat around. I guess Mountain played, but then it was like you know listening to Weather Underground communiques right over the the PA system. Not like a really fun time. I just want to give a quick shout out to Jonathan Custodio's reporting at the city, the Black Benji Way, Bronx. Peacemaker is killing led to gang truce honored with street naming uh, just because it's a mini history in there of the young lords with some incredible footage. If you go and find it, including of them performing musically. And uh, by the way, as a, as a music group, they're, they're really good. Oh, that's great. Very Beatles esque. I don't know if they played at um, the New York pop fest, but one of, one of the uh, demands was that community bands be allowed to, you know, share the stage with, um, you know what was promised was like you know miles davis but he didn't show so shifting from davis to a minute there there, there is a ton of john lennon in this book uh a lot of which is, is strung strung through uh peel and uh aj weberman uh the semi-famous infamous dylan garbologist uh who's still around and has a very different uh position these days as as, as a uh, somewhat right wing I'm, I'm sure he rejects the left and right terms uh uh jew um but i didn't realize how deep in Lenin was with these guys yeah and maybe you could talk a, a little about that i know we are bouncing from from thing to thing here i assure you the book is uh narratively strong and actually <laughs> beautifully beautifully uh, put together but there's so many interesting places and parts. I, I think giving listeners some taste of that might be uh, might be fun. Yeah. So in the early '70s, John Lennon, you know, moved to New York, and everybody on the left just sort of tried to, you know, attach themselves to him. Um, and a lot of that was just, uh, you know, there's the fact that he's John Lennon. He's a Beatle. Who wouldn't want to hang out with a Beatle? Uh, another thing is that he was a little bit politically inclined. And so, you know, Jerry Rubin, for instance, and also AJ Weberman, you know, they all saw that, you know, maybe Lenin and Yoko Ono could be vehicles to help them get their message out. Um, You know, John Sinclair in um, uh, Michigan had sort of used the MC5 as kind of a house band or, you know, an organ to to get out the White Panther message. And uh, for a brief moment, John Lennon was, you know, kind of voicing the concerns of of the the leftists, uh, you know, in New York. I think actually that Tom Fursad tried to recruit David Peel to, to work kind of in that mode. David Peel, who backed John Lennon for a while um, and was kind of like this, um, uh, you know, his music was almost more like heckling. It was, yeah. uh, you know, like like acoustic punk polkas. Um, and Lennon ends up producing them. They get signed Lennon, to Apple. Lennon ends up producing him. And, uh, you know, David Peel and his band The Lower East Side uh, backed John Lennon on you know, uh, TV shows, Mike Douglas show. 
Um, so, you know, these people are all sort of jockeying for position. I mean, the, I think they're all trying to get the, the they're all attaching to, to let in with the idea that there's a noble pursuit here. It's not just like, you know, uh, going after a star, but um, they all want him to be the vessel for their political uh, needs. And in fact, for a while, there's an idea that Lenin and Bob Dylan are going to do a kind of like caravan of concerts um, on the way out to San Diego for the Republican National Convention. And that becomes one of the reasons that John Lennon is, you know, totally hounded by the FBI and other agencies. And, and Weberman, to, just to clarify some of this, he's yeah. literally going through Dylan's garbage to come up with the encyclopedia of him. He's throwing a, a rather hostile birthday party outside of Dylan's house, which Dylan, who's not around at the time, I think has to fly back from, from Israel. Like, what the hell is happening here? Right. Um, and, and Lennon seems very amused by all this for quite a while. And both Weberman and Peel, I think, are the sort of real radicals who are not organizers or planners or anything else. They're crazy people, in my view, who uh, who lock onto something and, uh, and 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 are totally sincere and committed to it. So these are not the ones, you know, who who end up compromising their principles for 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 some political good or or whatever. You know, Peel, Peel's a performer, yeah. and so that, yeah. that's a slightly different register. But uh, their people are not playing the roles. They they are the things uh, for, yeah, for, yeah. for better and for worse. Right. Very sincere. And um, yeah, and, and, and Weberman and Peel sort of find themselves in the middle of, you know, they're, they're in the middle of Dylan and Lennon. And and eventually um, Weberman's upsetting of Bob Dylan alienates him from John Lennon. Um, so so while Lenin is amused for a little while, you know, Bob Dylan makes clear that he's not happy with any of this. And uh and and they they sort of lose that attachment to the to the rock stars. So I am bouncing us all around. Um I would like to go back to UPS for a minute and if you could talk a bit about what this becomes, uh with Forsyth's leadership and as a vehicle in other ways for Forsyth and, and the role this this plays and the underground press plays more broadly in right. coverage at the time, how it how it's perceived and understood by mainstream reporters, by Washington, and and, and so on, and how Forsyth fits into that. Yeah, so uh, the underground press syndicate had started, you know, before Forsyth came along, um, there were a handful of papers uh, around the country. Uh, I think there were five or six at the start who decided we're going to put together this united front and, you know, we'll pool some advertising and pool some um, you know, articles together, save money, but also it'll make us look stronger. Um, the East Village Other was the New York um, component of that. And the East Village Other was sort of formed as a, as a kind of uh, answer to the more staid village voice. Um, uh, it was, it was actually, there was a village voice, uh, uh, co-founder who, who was part of founding the East Village Other. And, um, Forsad contacted the East Village Other in 1967 and said this, and this was the kind of the first time he used the name Thomas King Forsad. Um, that was not his real name. He contacted them and said, Look, I want to like help any way I can. Um, I can do all of this work. I have this business experience, and uh, I'm in Phoenix, Arizona, but I'll I'll do what whatever you need. And th the people running the UPS were sort of overwhelmed already with work, so they were happy to farm it out. And this is how Forsad got his foot in the door. And for a while, he was he was publishing an underground paper in. Phoenix, kind of a, a reader's digest of other underground papers. And uh, he was kind of starting to build his countercultural persona. Um, but it was another two years before he really took the reins completely of the 
of the UPS. And so when he moved to New York, uh, he got involved in a lot of new initiatives for UPS. One of those was getting Bell and Howell to microfilm all of all of the papers. And this was a huge source of income. And it was also, um, you know, it was lucky for me because I was able to go back and look at all of these underground newspapers. Um, another result of the microfilming was that a lot of people said, why are they microfilming this stuff and sending it to, you know, these government agencies who are subscribing uh, to these newspapers? This is this is obviously uh, some kind of operation. Um, so it was one more way in which, you know, he aroused suspicion. Um but he was he was also very interested in um covering the news from an uh you know a, a radical left position. And so his um his fight for press credentials, first Senate and then uh White House credentials became, you know, a, a little bit of a you know cause that mainstream journalists uh rallied around. Uh there was a New York Times uh, reporter Fred Graham, who uh, really got behind Forsad's fight, and um, you know, eventually he got his Senate press credentials, and you know, made quite a quite a scene um, in the press gallery. Can you talk a little about how uh, what's happening with the press and with Forsad overlaps? just in time sequence at the least. And I see you being very cautious with perceptions of what might be happening and so on with Watergate. Right, right. There's a, well, there's a general sense of paranoia that's beginning, I guess, even before Watergate. Um, you know, there are the Pentagon Papers, um, which, you know, it was... Forsad sort of saw this as like, oh, the the mainstream media is finally like, you know, jumping on our beat. And there there were all these stories coming out during the Nixon administration about government surveillance. And the underground press was all over that. And in fact, some of the characters in the book become very involved in a landmark, you know, surveillance uh, case uh, that is still uh, presidential. Um, and and kind of played into FISA guidelines. Um, both of the national conventions, the Democratic and Republican conventions, were held in Miami in 1972. Um, the San Diego site was kiboshed because of the ITT scandal. Um, so the Zippies and the Yippies were there having a lot of conflicts with each other. The Zippies were having conflicts with the Vietnam, Vietnam veterans against the war. and actually pretty much every other group on the left. The Zippies were, you know, the fly in the ointment. And very, then, very quickly to jump yeah, in there. Yeah. The the ITT scandal in like a handful of words is <laughs> this giant uh, telephone company that, that was doing all sorts of really powerful in San Diego and was doing all sorts of deals that tied in with uh, with Nixon people. And his aides, and and some of whom later alleged that the Watergate break-in was uh, was motivated by creep suspicion that the DNC was was doing similar things. So 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 there's this strange cross cut between that and and Watergate. Just to throw that in. Yeah, thank you. Um, so in, in at, at the conventions in '72, there's all of this stunt demonstration going on, but there's also this uh, narrative that. The Republicans have really built up, which is that there's going to be a lot of violence at the convention. And so the, you know, the campaign <laughs> uh, to reelect the president uh, kind of kind of gets involved in making plans uh, for security reasons, um, or you could say um, with the pretext of security reasons. James McCord is is he within this, and he will later become famous as a Watergate burglar. Um, there's this rumor that the Vietnam veterans hear that there's going to be a mass slaughter of demonstrators at the convention. And then they begin preparing um, their violent defense 
of this supposed massacre that's going to happen. This becomes a big court trial. Horsad is at one of these meetings of the VVAW, um, and he's also kind of caught up in the accusations and the um, legal machinations that happen around this. He's indicted on a firebombing charge, and this kind of gets very complicated, but it, it plays into the Watergate defense for a little while. Um, the idea that these leftists were were planning violence um, becomes a justification for wiretapping and black bag operations. And so, uh, you know, Forsyth gets kind of just like caught caught in the wheels of of all of this, and uh, thinks he's going to go to jail. The case is dismissed, but he's spooked, and he will never be a public figure again. Although he remains, well, being very paranoid about that. I think at one point he pulls out a gun, somebody who takes his photograph. Uh, you know, it's interesting. He, he becomes very not not public, but sort of prominent within his own worlds and yeah. operations. Um, I would like to to touch on um, High Times, High Times Bookstore, which was run by uh, Jim Drugis, who some listeners will know as the uh, longtime owner after that of unoppressive non-imperialist uh, books on Carmine Street, R.I.P., um, and and maybe you can use that to weave in just just a little of the the New York City history and as high times is yeah. uh, is based here with some incredible offices with some incredible uh, product sometimes around it sometimes out of caution not yeah so um, like I like I said Forsad moved to New York um, kind of took up residence in Union Square. Um, he had a tent in the back of the loft that he slept in. Um, a couple of people told me that he slept in a coffin for a while, which uh, may be true. That certainly adds to the mystique. Um, High Times was was actually launched in the next UPS office, uh, which was on West 11th Street uh, in a basement. Um, and basically the idea was this can be a way to make some money and keep funding the underground press syndicate. Um, by that time, it was called the alternative press syndicate, uh, you know, changing times after, <laughs> after Vietnam, uh, I guess underground had a little bit too much of a, a, a connotation that they didn't want. So alternative weeklies were kind of what, you know, came out of the underground press. Um, more, you know, more and more of the underground papers started to turn into thing that, you know, the village voice became kind of the, the model um, the, where there was, you know, a, a real service element. Um, you know, where can you get like, you know, a, a, I think one of the good sayings is like a croissant at like 11 p.m. Um, it wasn't just radical politics anymore. But to, to keep the underground and alternative papers going um high times was you know seen as maybe a way to um cash in on on the the drug movement which they very much believed in legalization you know from the beginning obviously they were they were uh counterculture hippies um but they they saw high times as is possibly like a cash cow and they were right uh it became a publishing sensation very quickly um, they sold out, the, I think, the first three printings of the first issue. Uh, they distributed it not through normal channels, but often uh, through head shops and also by stuffing copies in with bales of marijuana when they sold weed. Uh, so that's like a really, you know, powerful um, word of mouth <laughs> method. Uh, one simple trick to, uh, to boost your uh, search numbers. <laughs> right, right. A good life hack. Uh, so. Uh, so they they had their their customer base, you know, involved people who were very much in the drug industry, um, and by I think 1975, 
certainly by 1976, you know, High Times was rivaling Rolling Stone in circulation numbers, which, you know, I, th I think surprise would surprise a lot of people today. Um, it, in in terms of like you know the New York aspect of of High Times, it it would have it would have been a very different magazine had it been published in San Francisco, say. You know, Forsad was very much even more than he was a um, a hippie. I would say you know he was into things that were on you know, the the uh, things that were part of a, the vanguard, things that were on the outer edge. And so he was very drawn to, um, you know, the downtown New York art scene. He was drawn to punk rock. Um, you know, there's uh, a, a great Susan Sontag interview in, in an issue of High Times where she talks about how she was going to go see the Ramones at CBGB, but um, she decided that, it, you know, it, maybe instead she would sit and talk to High Times that night. Um, it's, it's a really, it's a really great snapshot of of that time. Um, so, so High Times became, you know, not not just drug culture, but but also, um, you know, very much like New York culture of the 1970s. Um, and when Forsad put uh, Johnny Rotten on the cover, you know, there was a whole angry memo from most of the staff saying like, you've gone too far. This is, you know, this is not what we signed up for. So real quick, before we bounce around again, let's talk for a moment about a uh, facade and the uh, sex pistols. Yeah. Well, I said earlier that I, you know, I, I think that Forsad was looking for, you know, kind of his MC five in a way he was, uh, you know, he had dragged, um, David Peel out on a, a cross country post Woodstock series of rock festivals, and together they basically antagonized a um, you know a, a camera crew that was making a movie, antagonized all the hippies, um, went around and basically just caused trouble. And I think when he saw the Sex Pistols, he thought, you know, these are these are my kind of guys. They're really upsetting everyone. Um, you know, I think he, he likes the music, but I think, you know, his contrarianism was probably what really drew him to the band. And so he wanted to make a film about them and, uh, Warner brothers on whose, uh, you know, label the sex pistols were in the United States, uh, had no interest in this. And so when the sex pistols did their U S tour, uh, where Saad had a camera crew that was kind of guerrilla style chasing them ar around and also like sneaking cameras into uh, their shows, um, getting kicked out repeatedly, um, trying to make a Sex Pistols movie without the approval of either Warner Brothers or the Sex Pistols. Um, and, and the Sex Pistols themselves um, said they thought that for Saad was working for the CIA. So they, they just wanted to get away from him. Um, and he's but, literally following them around and, and here I've got a, I've got a box full of cash. Let's do this yeah. and getting notes back, just saying, fuck all. Right. Right. Sort of. He's, he's really like playing a part at this, at this point where he's, you know, getting chauffeured around in, uh, you know, Rolls Royces and trying to be like Mr. Moneybags to uh, make offers to the Sex Pistols. Um, you know, that's something that Forsad did every couple of years was, was try on a new persona. Um, and so, so this, this attempt really failed. And uh, the, I mean, they did get a movie out of it called DOA. Um, but at the end of the tour, the Sex Pistols broke up. Um, Forsad did go to Jamaica. He heard that, uh, that Johnny Rotten was, was, trying to do a new musical project, which I, I think he was starting PIL. Um, but he, he actually flew to Jamaica looking for Johnny Rotten afterward uh, to no avail. So you brought up that the one move away is High Times, which has this incredible increase in circulation. And again, as a bunch of states are for the first time legalizing pot, you know, boosted it by by putting bales of magazines in with uh, with bales of weed. And, and Forsyth is bringing in tons, um, literally, you know, over, over the stretch of time. 
uh, th there's more there and how this sort of contributes to the end of his life. When, when one of these smuggling missions goes wrong, we probably can't get to in the time uh, remaining. But there's also some speculation, I think, the way you have it, um, that, that the magazine was also sort of a... Uh, a money laundering operation for some of the, uh, you know, the weed money that was also paying for the magazine. Yeah, I, I think it's funny. I, I talked to um, a uh, one of the the first publishers of the magazine the other night, and he wanted to assure me that the books were straight by the time he was there. Um, but in the very beginning, there was there was a lot of I think creative bookkeeping going on, um, and there was in fact. Um, a shadow team of High Times staff. Uh, I, I I thought this was marvelous that um, in case the magazine got busted, there was like a, an editor and an art director and a production person like on call so that they could like sweep in and swoop in and, um, you know, make sure that they didn't miss, miss an issue. Um, I, I I don't know that that's a common um, publishing <laughs> method these days, um, but but yeah, there was there was kind of like a, um, a blurry line between the the legitimate business and the illegitimate business, which you know Fursad had been um, dabbling in at least for for years before High Times, um, and I think shortly before. The magazine uh, was launched. He'd really, he'd really increased his involvement in the drug business. Um, I talk in, in the book a little bit about um, kind of his his proto dispensary um, that was set up um, near the uh, uh, women's house of detention in the West Village. Uh, it was, you know, a, a kind of thing where you'd you'd go in uh, to this this loft space. And there would be jars of different strains and you could sample and uh, you could have a little private cubicle to test test the products. Um, but it was really about buying in bulk. Once you once you found what you liked, you would um, you would get uh, pounds of it uh, that they would they would bring out from the back. Um, you know, it was it was really kind of. Uh, uh, 50 years ahead of its time. And as I understand it from the book, there, there was a uh, cooler place yeah. for individuals that had a similar sort of thing. And people would go there like a weed easy and get high and be around each other. And for Saad's right. operation was much more, be quiet, don't spread the phone number, come right. in, figure it out, make your bulk purchase and, and, and be gone. And thank you very much. Right. He had a, he had a friend who had, 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 done um kind of a, a more informal uh more familial version of this on crosby street and uh forsad liked a lot of that but i think he saw ways in which it could be you know more coldly profitable i guess so i assure listeners as we're bouncing around that the, these are just some strands in this book which really beautifully ties all of this material together we'll see if we can uh, repeat that trick on on the pod but it's there on the page so closer question one of two was this guy a cop <laughs> i i don't think so um you know i i i really hoped that i would have been able to get dea files or or, or files of BNDD, which was the previous drug agency. Um, you know, I, I never, I never would hold my breath to get CIA files. Um, but what I did have was FBI files and, um, you know, the FBI files uh, sort of stopped around the high, at the time that high times started. Um, so there's certainly a lot of government information on him a lot of government paper on forsad that uh i could not retrieve and 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 hopefully you know if, if you have any um um curious listeners out there who are really good <laughs> at penetrating the foia system um maybe they can do some home sleuthing 
Um, there, there are all these circumstantial things that that really do make Forsad look like, oh, this is a provocateur. Um, but I think, I, I think that if if he did ever work for the the government, I it would have been trying to play both sides against each other. Uh, he seems like the kind of person who might have thought he could beat the government at its own game. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I spoke to people who knew him well, who thought he was an agent. And I spoke, of course, to people who knew him well, who thought he would never do that. Um, so I, I had the challenge of not, not being able to answer that question in the book. It's a, it's not Encyclopedia Brown. <laughs> it's not an answer page at the end. But, you know, as a reader, and obviously I'm dependent on your years of research and interviews and information here, yeah. it's it's really fascinating to think about. And I at least turned over in my head from one side of this to the other several yeah. times in the course of, of going through, you know, and that, that, that the rabbi and his wife joke, uh, you must be right. You must be right. <laughs> says, you idiot. They can't both be right. You must be right, too. Uh, <laughs> To uh, to, to so to close us out here, can you deep breath, narrator voice, uh, just talk about the lessons and application and interest in all this history for uh today, and and the world we are presently in? Yeah, sure. I I, I mean I think what I've really come away from is a sympathy for um what the boomer generation <laughs> struggled with i mean i think uh, you know i i think the, the there are lessons about um about paranoia and divisiveness and um you know factionalism um based on those you know, you know based on fear um i think you know one of the insidious things about COINTELPRO, the FBI, you know, program, um, and, and similar operations, um, you know, is, is, is not that it, it lands activists in jail, but that it, um, erodes the trust, you know, uh, among, <laughs> among these activists. Um, I mean, I think it's, it's interesting now because, you know, people on the right are are very you know up in arms about the FBI and saying they are you know acting as provocateurs, um, and so you know this this is uh, partially a story about how the left was um, kind of decimated by by that. Um, you know, I I, I think. Um, I think also, it, it, you know, it just, it, it, there was no roadmap um, for what happened in the 1970s. And I would hope that um, now what happened in the 1970s can be a little bit of a roadmap or a cautionary tale, um, you know, for for what is going on in the world today. Highlights for children, but maybe, maybe we can look at these goofuses and, uh, <laughs> and be the galants of the future. <laughs> which isn't which isn't to say that you know it, that it was failure i mean the the you know marijuana uh is uh is legalized in many places and it is a you know uh, uh, at least an indirect result of um forsad and high times um you know the there's there's also you know the uh commercialization of that industry and the corporatization of that industry um, which I think High Times has to bear some of, the, you know, the responsibility for as well. But and they, um, they got THC, the, the parent company of High Times. That's right. its initials, right? I mean, they got bought by like venture capitalists who eventually folded the damn thing that, that had been a license to print money for a long time. It's back. It it is it is it is it is printing again. Um, but yeah, I I I think I think the the lessons are are political and i think the um you know the the benefits are are um 
are all on the marijuana side. <laughs> yeah. Huh. Sean, thank you a ton um, because there is biblical flooding happening Friday morning as we're recording this. I'm going to zoom to an outro right now and, and shift my my attention to that. Uh, God is telling us uh, something, it appears. Um, again, the book is, the author is Sean Howe, and the book is Agents of Chaos, Thomas King Forsyth, High Times, and the Paranoid End of the 1970s. Um, awesome cover, awesome read. Uh, pick it up. Uh, you won't regret it. Thank you, Sean. Thank you so much. F-A-Q. This has been FAQ NYC. We're part of the city, a nonprofit, nonpartisan newsroom dedicated to hard-hitting reporting that serves the people of New York. Our work is freely available to everyone at thecity.nyc and is supported by listeners and readers like you. Go to thecity.nyc slash give if you'd like to pitch in. We also receive support from P&T Network. An independent bookstore, cafe, and event space on Manhattan's Lower East Side with a podcast studio that can be freely reserved for community use. We're a proud member of the Brickhouse Cooperative of Independent Journalists, Critics, and Artists. Find it all at Popula.com and are affiliated with the Colin Powell School at CUNY City College, where Chrissy Greer is one of the inaugural fellows. Our host today was me, Harry Siegel, who's also our executive producer. Our engineer is the inimitable Adam Kamara. A special thank you again to Sean Howe, author of Agents of Chaos. And thank you, listener, for joining us and making it this far. Be kind, be cool, and we'll be back soon with more A Hard Rain Is Falling.